Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are. Today, uh, we'd like to welcome you to Apache's flagship program, Science to Action. Science to Action is a platform of Apache where we invite eminent scientists and clinicians or clinician scientists who in their careers have been able to move scientific discoveries into actionable new processes. This can be in the form of creation of new therapies, policies, advisories, or new research bases. The platform selects eminent scientists to talk about their vision and experiences in integrating science and decision-making and or creating change to help the common public. So today we have with us Professor Deherty, Peter Deherty, Nobel Laureate, and it is our great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Deherty. Well, many thanks for the welcome, Ruby, and it's always wonderful to be interacting with pediatricians. I spent a long time at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, and I know that pediatricians are the salt of the earth. Thank you very much. So I will now start with introducing you, and then we will go on to the questions. Thank you very much for being with us, Professor Deherty. The pleasure. So, Professor Peter Deherty is an Australian immunologist and pathologist. Yeah who with Rolf Zinkerkel of Switzerland received the Nobel Prize of Physiology and Medicine in 1996 for the discovery of how the body's immune system distinguishes virus infected cells from normal cells. After leading a research group at the Vista Institute in Philadelphia and teaching in the University of Pennsylvania, he headed the Department of Experimental Pathophysiology at John Curtin School of Medical Research in Canberra. He has served in several roles uh, in different uh, places, including heading the Department of Immunology at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. And he also served in many other institutes and currently is at the Peter Deherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, a joint venture uh, with the University of Melbourne and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Peter, as you know, is also an author of many books, including The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize. And he brings to us so much in addition to science, the application of science, how it relates to the common public, how it helps changing lives uh, of the common people and how it can really stimulate the young people into doing science. So it's my great honor and a pleasure to start having this dialogue with uh, Professor Peter Deherty. Thank you very much, Ruby. And, and thank you for the promotion because I trained <laughs> initially as a veterinarian and I'm, I'm really a basic scientist with a, back, with a strong interest in viral immunity and pathogenesis, and I'm an experimentalist. But yes. since the Nobel Prize in 1996, I've also been doing a great deal of public science communication, which is what I'm doing now, basically. At age 80, no longer running a laboratory. I, d I act as a discussant with my young colleagues two to three times a week on our, our our meetings that we have of the group leaders, and I'm doing public communication to try and get the message out about COVID-19, vaccination, and so forth. Yeah, this is wonderful. But, uh, I mean, this is actually what uh, true leaders do, because besides what they've achieved in their scientific career, uh, leading to a Nobel Prize, they actually stimulate the younger generation. Uh, to go into science and they also communicate with the public to give them the right knowledge in a language that is easy for them to understand as a good communicator. So I think um, we have just the perfect 
um, Nobel Prize uh, winner with us today, and we are greatly honored uh, once again. So I'll start with my first question to you, Peter. And my first question to you is, what inspired you to take up science as your career? Well, well, you know, as a very young boy, a, a rather young 16-year-old, especially by, by contemporary standards, uh, I, um, I decided to go to the veterinary school because I wanted to increase world food production, a very modest goal. And, uh, and I th thought I didn't want to be a physician because I didn't want to talk to sick people all the time. But I discovered that veterinarians talk to people with sick animals. So that, that, that was another matter. And of course, all pediatricians pretty much need to be good communicators because you're communicating both with children and parents. But, um, but I, I went down the science road. And uh, for 10 years, I did research on infectious diseases of domestic animals both in Australia and in Scotland, and then at the Australian National University in Canberra, where I'd gone to really learn about cell-mediated immunity. The whole story of T cells was just starting to emerge, and there was a good group there. And I was supposed to go on then back to the, our big government research organisation, the CSIRO. My, my young colleague, Rolf Zinkenagel, and I, who was uh, a visiting fellow from Switzerland, uh, made that very big discovery that led to the Nobel Prize. And I never got back to the veterinary world. I became an MD, a mouse doctor, uh, for many years. <laughs> and the great gratification, really, uh, of the research programs I've been involved in and have led, to, in a sense, is that my young colleagues have taken all this forward. And now we're taking it forward very rapidly, particularly my colleague, Catherine Kizieska, into humans. And now, we are able, because of modern molecular technology, we are able to do the most fantastic studies in human beings. There's still a lot that we, we simply don't know about immune responses in humans. And I'd say pediatrics and, and geriatrics are two areas where we need much, much better understanding. So for any young pediatrician who wants to go down this road, I think that it's, it's wide open. Thank you very much. Um, what were the challenges that uh, you faced during your career in science as you were um, working in the labs and uh, trying to uh, understand science and developing uh, new uh, evidences, uh, you know, publishing uh, many papers? What were the challenges that you faced? And, and you know, without getting demotivated, what actually really motivated you to pursue in that path? And what led you to winning the Nobel Prize, which I'm sure when you were working, you would have never imagined? In a way, uh, working in a medical environment and not being medical has some advantages and many disadvantages, of course. But one of the advantages is they don't ask, ask you to become a head of a clinical department or take on any of those rather onerous responsibilities that can be enormous, uh, uh, use your time. So basically, I'm a researcher who, who's driven by curiosity and I'm in love with data. I, I, I work from data. I'm a data-driven scientist. And when I talk to young scientists, I tell them, if I'm asked for advice about how to do science, look at your data, love your data, communicate with your data, forget about all that romantic stuff, data is it. I mean, so of course they don't forget about all the romantic stuff and that's just as well because we do need smart people to reproduce. But, um, but I think that's, I'm driven by curiosity. But uh, if you're going to live by your wits, you have to be robust psychologically and you have to be good because you've got to make a living out of it and there's not that many livings in that. And I've, I've been uh, fortunate in being able to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, you've answered partly my question as you talked about telling your uh, young um, scientists to, to be looking at the data and uh, you know, base your science on, on data. But, you know, uh, having also been working in basic research, very often we are at a, like at a dead end, you know, you're faced mm -hmm. against a wall. You don't have, uh, you know, positive results and you're like uh, really uh, demotivated at times, you know, like um, 
for example, when I was working with gamma delta T cells myself, I mean, with with uh, especially in the mucosal uh, environment, there are so few cells, and you know, working with them, trying to uh, you know analyze the repertoire, the differentiate them from what's in the peripheral blood. I was up against a wall. So I'm sure that many people doing science at di different levels do face these kind of challenges. So yeah. what would be your message to the young people um, uh, on in pursuing science? How can you, uh, what would you say for them to love? Because I think curiosity, as you rightly mentioned, is the most important thing, is to be curious. That is what leads you uh, one to uh, want to do something. But how does one actually um, uh, not be demotivated or re-energize oneself? And where where should one focus? Yes, well, it, it, it's different at different stages of a career. As you know, once you start out, when you start out, whether you come from a medical or a science background or whatever, you need to become competent. If you're going to be a lab scientist, you need to work in a lab for a bit learn the technology, learn the experience, and learn the experience of failure, because quite frankly, things will go wrong. As you say, we often get blocked and we try to get past that. We come up with a different way of looking at it, a different idea. In my case, that's generally come from looking at the data, but um, that's not how everyone works. You know, in, in medicine and, and biology, we've never developed a separate category of theoreticians the way the physicists have. The, the subject's not amenable to it. Uh, the problem is evolution, and evolution doesn't follow the laws. I mean, it does follow the laws of physics and chemistry eventually, but it often chooses, through evolution, we choose the best available path. So it's not necessarily the way you design it and, and so forth. So, so it works at different levels. Initially, you've just got to do some competent work and write it up and write a PhD thesis or, or not. It doesn't matter. With, if you're an MD, you may not, you don't need to do that. And then, of course, as you you become more successful and you build a group, what what you will have going is is several different lines of research. So that if one area crashes and burns, as we did actually with gamma delta T cells, um, <laughs> then basically something else will be going. Now that's not so great for the people doing that. And you have to watch the young people very carefully to see they don't don't get stuck in a dead end, and give them some opportunity to get to get data and and learn the game. So so it's a matter of to some extent managing expectations and 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 having some different lines of, of investigation. Wonderful. I think this will be a very important message for many of our young scientists. Uh, and especially clinician scientists who have to take out time from beyond their clinical work. And it requires more uh, passion and uh, more curiosity, actually, in, and it's more challenging. And uh, even so, I would say for women, because you're multitasking. So, uh, you know, it's I think these words that come from you are very inspirational to many people. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this will help many of our young scientists uh, clinician scientists and scientists uh, to go ahead in life in, in, in research. Uh, now, currently, you're involved in a lot of public communication and creating, uh, as like I would say, translating the understanding of science in an easy to understand way and its implications in, in the real world setting for the common public. And this is so crucial because even in clinical medicine, now we are more involved, even while developing guidelines, to involve the patients, to understand the patient's perspective, to have patient-reported outcomes. So for someone at your level to actually communicate to the public is really a, a huge um, uh, impact, I would say. And I would like to hear from you how uh, you uh, are... Um, doing this in communicating to the public and what do you see where does this uh, lead to yes I, I um i think the first thing about public communication is mutual respect you have to, you have to respect the people you're trying to communicate with and even if they're they're hostile um try to to 
get to their wavelength and say what helps them. I mean, public communication is not about making yourself seem important. It's about trying to get a message across. And that's what you always have to keep in mind. Trying to get your message across, know your audience and, and know at what level that message can be cast. So that's part of it. And it takes some learning, I think, to, to actually, some experience of this to actually do it. The way I'm communicating at the moment is uh, basically I'm, I'm on radio TV when people ask me to speak. Um, but there's, um, and then I'm I'm on Twitter, which my book publishers got me onto years ago. I, I uh, now have more than sixty four thousand followers, which surprises wow. me. I'm I'm not like a rock star. I'm not like a Kardashian or something who's who's an important person. I'm just a a, a, a dumb scientist. But uh, but I do get a fair amount of information out that way, and also get a very good idea of what people are thinking and what's concerning them, and what really worries them. And so that's useful, but it's a bit of a time sink and you have to be very careful of it. I, I've always saying to young scientists and young doctors, uh, really, you have to understand that you're well-educated scientifically compared with 99% of the communication uh, community. Um, you, you, you have an in-depth understanding. You know uh, what it takes to understand. And even if you haven't done any science, you you understand the complexity of these issues. So so take a little bit of time out and and go on social media. If you've got great illustrated material, use YouTube, use Facebook, use uh, use Twitter, and just try and get these messages out to people and to people you talk to daily. It's really important we do that, and uh, we all do it because. I'm an old guy. Um, some people will listen to a message from someone like me, but they'll often listen much, much better to a message who comes from someone young and uh, and is in, on their wavelength much more. So we all need to be science communicators. Now, apart from that, I've written, i published now six books. Number seven will come out uh, next month. It's called An Insider's Plague Year. It's ba basically about the year of 2020 and what we did at our institute and how I was involved in it. Um, and, um, and that's another way of communicating. Uh, the numbers of people who read books aren't, aren't that great and science books never sell all that well unless they're written by smart journalists. And uh, the other thing is I've been writing a, a weekly essay for our website. It's called Setting It Straight. You can read it on the Doherty Institute website. And, uh, and I'm trying to describe complex uh, issues and complex uh, situations in in this area of science uh, for for a general reader who's intelligent and can engage. Thank you very much, Peter. And you know, uh, in relation to your Nobel Prize that you worked on the virus related uh, uh, science, uh, looking at your book that you have developed in 2020 and with COVID. How would you describe any differences between uh, what you perceived and what is happening now uh, in the in the real situation? I well, even say this even more because I think the communication from you is so important as a scientist, as a Nobel laureate. Uh, when there's so much of um, mis uh, myths in the in the in the social media and. Uh, then groups that are actually working against the vaccines. And it's so important for the right message. And we are trying very hard to actually create uh, the facts and to disseminate that. So uh, hearing from you would be very important for us and for our audience. Um, so please let me know what you have to say. Well, you know, the Nobel Prize was in 1996. And I, I actually hadn't started to use email in 1996 i was using a computer and writing on a computer and and the work was done back in the mid 1970s so social media nobody would have known what you were talking about if you mentioned it so um so i've been and of course the science of that time has been totally transformed by modern molecular science we couldn't sequence large amounts of, we could only we couldn't sequence get enough cell surface protein to sequence because we didn't have enough recombinant DNA technology. 
uh, we couldn't just go out and sequence genes. I mean, people sequence proteins, but they're just beginning to sequence mRNA at that stage, I think. Um, and uh, there were no monoclonal antibodies, I mean, and so on and so on. So it was the world of the dinosaurs when we just showed killer T cells interacting with a target cell in the nature letters that eventually got us a Nobel Prize. They were drawn like a ping pong ball interacting with the tennis ball with some squiggles on the surface. Ten years later, we're looking, and 20 years later, we're looking at crystals and at co-crystals, which are telling us the chemistry of those interactions. So the, the world of science has transformed. And, of course, one of the great transformations has been modern molecular science has enabled us to do great work with human beings because we can look at the profile of genes being read out in a single lymphocyte. And, of course, as you know, you, you, you can't get a lot of blood from kids. So that's a really big plus. Thank you very much. And um, uh, I'd like to also ask you finally that if you had to give a single message or a couple of messages to our organization as the Asia Pacific Association of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, where, as you rightly said, we, we deal with pediatrics and we deal with geriatrics. We, we are across the different age groups uh, of the lifespan. And we have many young people uh, in our community, and we are trying to be, uh, to develop leadership uh, and motivate the young people. So, if there is any message that you would like to give us that we could do as an organization uh, to help uh, in this, uh, we'd be really grateful to hear that from you. Yes, I, I think I think the toughest one of the toughest games in science is being a physician scientist. It's really very demanding. But of course, a lot of people who go into medicine are very smart people and they, they need that additional satisfaction, both for their, for their own, own satisfaction and to feel they're getting towards something. So I've got great colleagues from epidemiologists to, um, to immunologists to, uh, to infectious disease physicians and so forth who are doing this. And I, I, I admire them greatly. And so, um, so basically though, as a physician, you always have the alternative. You, you have the, the job of being a good doctor. And, and that, of course, for any physician, is the first thing you have to do after graduating from medical school. You have to learn to be a good doctor. We always have to be good professionals. That's great. The science can be an add-on or it can become the passion that dominates, and it depends on the personality. We see, I've seen with my American colleagues particularly, people who did MD, PhD degrees way back, that many of them are functioning essentially like lab investigators. Uh, some of them have gone back to medicine and, and, a, and a heroic few uh, maintain that physician investigator role, though that is easier now to do really well because of modern molecular science. So I think your whole life is not invested in the science as a physician. You have that other string to your bow. And, and one of the issues with scientists is people have varying levels of, of, of ability, quite frankly. And for the, for the lab scientist with a PhD, that often means if doing sometimes people, the best thing you can do for people is actually advise them to move on or, or help them find something else in industry, communications, uh, the regulatory bodies and so forth. So sometimes not everyone is going to make it as a research scientist. Fortunately, as a physician, you can moderate that position. And I think that's a very good position to be in. And so much of medical research now is about human beings, not about mice. Thank you very much, Professor Peter Deherty. It was, in fact, a wonderful uh, chance to have this uh, conversation with you. Um, looking at your life and all what you have done, I think is something that everybody would want to be in that place. I mean, doing science, I mean, leading to the Nobel Prize, and then uh, mentoring a lot of people, stimulating them, uh, teaching them the right, giving them the right direction, and then uh, writing books which translate the message to a, a large uh, group of people around the world and then communicating to the public, which is so important 
uh, and in a language that is easy for them to understand. So I would say it's a perfect life. <laughs> I've never even learned to play golf. So. Uh, yeah, but it's wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you have touched every element of, of life. I would say that you have your science has led to clinical applications, has led to so much of uh, new knowledge. Uh, has today is even more relevant in this COVID pandemic, uh, which you never would have perceived when you were actually working on uh, that in your younger days. And then here you are talking to people and making them understand the value of data and stimulating them and also uh, providing uh, the communication to the public so that people get the right message. So. Honestly, we are greatly honored and we thank you very much for your time, despite your really hectic schedule. And we look forward to having you again uh, on Apache platform. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, Ruby. And advice to young scientists as a final word, there's always a bit of luck involved, so get lucky. So. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's true about life too. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. Thank you very much.